Path 17 is you're supposed to teach loops to an intermediate caster, and that would, um, or an intermediate student, and that would include understanding or have them understand the role of the rod tip path and how it affects loop formation, and also how do you correct problems with loops um, when you're done. So you're going to have to teach a wide loop, a narrow loop, a tailing loop, um, and then what kind of rod tip path co uh, creates all those different kinds of loops. And then what do you do if a person's too wristy and they have too big a loop? What do you do if somebody has a, uh, a tailing loop? And my feeling about task 17 is if you organize it well, it should still only, I mean, obviously, uh, honestly, to teach uh, intermediate about loops is going to take some time. But I think that um, you know, we're going to try to do this in five minutes, five and a half minutes, and if you do it very, you're going to have to practice this, otherwise it takes forever. So remember, you're not going to worry about a lot of stuff like uh, casting arc and that kind of stuff. Don't get caught up starting to talk about stuff that isn't necessary for just teaching this task, otherwise you're going to be out here for 10 minutes and you're going to have a whole lot of examiners that are not very excited about it. So I'm going to give you a good example. I've had a lot of students take this test and everybody's done well on this task. So I think this is a really good way of doing it. You may make some minor modifications, but I can't imagine it's going to be any better organized than the way I'm doing it. So what I'm going to start off with is a, a rod, just with a regular line, and I'm going to play like they've just read me the, uh, I'm, going to, I'm just going to go through the first part of it. I'll do that right now, and then we're going to time it so you can kind of see when we start the task. But the first thing you're going to do is You've got the fly out to 40 feet because that's about where it was when you did the pick up and lay down. Now, I see a lot of people just, just stumbling around at this point wondering what to do next. They start to talk. Here's how I do it. And I'm just going to do this. I'm going to have um, Chris pan out a little bit so you can see what I do. So he's going to pan out and move the camera a little bit to your left so you can see the 30 foot cone and the 40 foot cone and the 45 foot cone because we're going to use those cones and I'm going to try to be as organized as I can and then I'll come back and just assume that uh, you're, you're, um, we're going to pick up where we left off in other words. So let's do that first. So to set this task up should not take any more than 15 to 20 seconds. So you're ready to start doing your task. So I'm just going to show you what I would do. They've read me the instructions, and I practice this. Make sure you can do this really pretty much seamlessly and flawlessly because every second counts when you're doing these teaching tasks. So they've read me the directions. I'm just going to ask them if they could come out. So they're standing over there where the camera is someplace. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk out here, and I'm dragging my fly line. So I'm dragging my fly line. When I get to the 30-foot cone, I'm going to move it to the 35 foot cone. And then I've already got a 45 foot cone. Now what I've done is I've created a loop right here and I'm going to stand here. So there's a nice narrow loop already created. Now I'm going to go back to the, the yarn, but you can see that took me very little time. I had to stoop down to get one cone. I've got a really skinny narrow loop and this is where I start. And remember, the examiners are over there, and we're going to do this whole task from that position, but we're going to move the camera again, and I'm going to use a yarn rod so you can see it a lot better. So here we go. So we're going to move the camera, and we'll start assuming we're already to here, and I'm going to use the yarn rod, but you can certainly use your own fly rod to finish this uh, exam. So what you've done is you've walked out here, and you're now in this position. And that's where you're going to be. And again, I'm using a yarn rod, but you could use a regular rod at this point. Point is, you've come out, you've come to here, you pull the line back, so now you have a loop. So we're going to start the exam right here. And your examiners are standing about where the camera is, so make sure the examiner's in the right place. And also, for all these tasks, make sure, for instance, you don't have a lot of distractions behind you. Um, you don't want to have a lot of noise. You want to try to get the sun not in their eyes. If the sun's going to be in somebody's eyes, make sure that it's in your eyes. Um, so this is where we're going to be. So let's start right now. We spent 15 seconds so far just organizing this, and now we're going to start the task. So this is a loop, and the loop is what's formed after the stop of the rod. And if you can see this loop, we're going to call this is the rod right here, and we've cast that direction to your left. This is going to be the bottom leg of a loop or the rod leg of a loop, and this is the fly leg or the top leg of the loop. This is the nose of the loop. This particular 
loop is pretty narrow. You can see this particular loop is about the width of my foot, so that's a narrow loop. That's caused by a straight line rod tip path, which we're going to show in just a second, so you sort of get an understanding of that. There are other loops too. This is a loop. That's a much wider loop. You can see that this loop is much wider. This loop is about three of my feet. So that loop is called a wide loop. Now it's got a wider nose. It's uh, the, the legs, the fly leg, or the rod leg and the fly leg are farther apart. The narrow loop is good for, for uh, uh, casting into the wind. It's much more efficient. It's fast. It's more accurate. This loop, though, can be used also. Um, this, this wider loop has a lot of uses during uh, casting, especially when you're casting big nymphs or big flies or heavy lines, that kind of thing. So this is not necessarily a bad loop. So we just have a narrow loop and a wide loop. This loop is caused by a rainbow shaped rod tip path, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So this would be a straight line and this would be a rainbow and you're going to see that a little more clearly in just a second. There's another couple of loops we'd like to discuss. This one is a tailing loop. The top leg or the fly leg dips below the bottom leg or the rod leg and causes a problem. This is the loop that causes knots. And people call them wind knots, but they're not really from the wind. They can be exacerbated by the wind, but it's not the wind. It's the lack of understanding about how to cast and making sure that you don't make this error, which we'll talk about in a little while. So this is a tailing loop. There's another loop that is oftentimes confused. This is a trailing loop. A trailing loop, you can see that the top leg is straight. Therefore, you did not have a dip in a rod tip path, which is what causes this loop. This loop is caused by a dip in a rod tip path. The rod tip goes along, it dips, and it comes back up again. So we're going to show those kind of loops. This one here, the trailing loop, or the underslung loop, is simply a matter of gravity. It's not a matter of a rod tip path problem, and it's very frequent when you're casting a long distance or certain wind conditions. So let's talk about rod tip path real quick. If I've got, and we're going to try to see this so you can see this, but if my rod tip travels, this is my casting arc. This is my piece of pie that I need. So here we are. I'm going along. My rod bends. It follows pretty much a straight line. It unbends and it comes to here. That's a straight line rod tip path, and that causes a narrow loop. Now what happens if I have the same amount of rod bend I just had, but I start way down here. I come up and come back down again. That is a rainbow shaped rod tip path, that causes the big fat loop. What if I come along here and then all of a sudden I punch it and my rod tip dips and then my rod tip comes up again, that is going to be a tailing loop caused by a dip in a rod tip path. So what I'd like you to do right now, I'm going to go ahead and cast some loops and I want you to take a look at what loop it is. So you're going to tell me what loop it is and then you're going to tell me what kind of a rod tip path causes it. So here's some loops. So you tell me what loop it is and then tell me what rod tip path causes this loop. Here's the first one. Okay, what rod tip path causes that? You're right, big old rainbow. You can see the rod tip path going in a rainbow shape and it causes a big wide loop. How about this one? On this next cast. Next cast. Okay, good. That's a tailing loop because the rod tip path dips. And how about this one? That's another tailing tendency. Here we go. Okay, those are narrow loops caused by a more straight line rod tip path. So those are the kinds of loops that we're going to be creating. The most common mistake that people make, or the most common error that people have, especially amongst the beginners, is probably too much risk. So you're seeing this. So what I'd like you to do is, if uh, Mr. Examiner, Mrs. Examiner, if you could come out and do this for me, I'd like to correct that. So now, assuming they've come out and they're standing here and they're doing this, 
I would say there's a couple of things we can do at this point. We can strap their wrist down, which is going to pretty much prevent that. We can put the butt of their rod inside the sleeve, which is going to prevent it. And you can actually have them do that. You can just hold a noodle up back here and in the front, so they just tell them not to hit the noodle. Don't hit the noodle. If you don't hit the noodle, you can't get this. If you get this, it's because you're obviously whacking a noodle. The other thing you can do is just have them watch. I want you to stop your rod just as it crosses that oak tree. Don't let it go down into that palm tree. Just stop right here. The same thing in the back. You want to stop just as it hits that big palm tree. So watch it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. So you stop at different places. So that's another way of doing it. There's some other uh, ways you can do it too. You can do pantomiming. There's a lot of things and you can kind of check the list of corrections. But that's a good way to start. That's four or five ways. Now the other thing that you're supposed to do is include the correction of a tailing loop. My feeling about this is I've asked all of my students just to ask the examiner to, if it's okay just to show corrections of tailing loops with your intermediate casters, which you're doing in task number 18, you're supposed to demonstrate three tailing loops and then discuss the corrections of those three tailing loops. So most examiners just say, fine, let's go to 18, otherwise you've already done one. So it doesn't really matter. And the other thing, I, my argument would be that tailing loops are primarily not a, a, a beginner casting error to a lot of extent. This is a much more common error amongst beginners than is a tailing loop. A tailing loop is way less common. Well, um, but if it is common, and if it does happen, it's the same exact, it doesn't matter who's throwing a tail, whether it's an advanced caster, an intermediate caster, or a beginning caster, the uh, issue is the same. It's a dip in a rod tip path, and you've got to figure out where that dip is occurring and why, and then correct it. So I just ask my, at, at that point, after I get done with showing them how to stop this, my suggestion is just to ask the examiner, can we just do this in task 18? If he says no, then he wants you to do it now, then pick one. And my suggestion is you pick inappropriate application of power. Um, you can pick creep too, and do the creep, have the examiner try to do it, and you've got to use one of the one of the corrections that we talk about in 18. So that is, that's uh, task number uh, 17. It's pretty, pretty fast, pretty smooth. Um, I did some extra talking in there, but man, make sure you practice this, get it down. You get your line out, you talk about the loop, hey, this is a narrow loop, a good narrow loop, you describe what legs mean, um, the nose of the loop, the top leg, the bottom leg, uh, the narrow loop is good for accuracy, for distance because it's more efficient because that little narrow, narrow loop goes through the wind better, the wide loop and that the fact that it's also a good loop, and then of course the tailing loop. You don't really have to do the trailing loop um, for a beginner, but um, even some CI candidates confuse those two. That's why I sort of put it in there for this video. A trailing loop or an underslung loop is not a tailing loop. So, um, because it, the, remember, the top, just so you'll understand this, and this is not something you'd be talking about with a, with a, uh, a beginning student, but that top leg, the, the path of the rod tip determines what the top leg looks like. So if your loop, if your rod dips, then that's going to be what it looks like. In task 18, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But if your rod dips a long ways, you're going to have a long, big, giant tail. If it just barely dips, you'll just have a, a little bit of a tailing tendency. But you can see that the, the top leg is affected by the, the path of the rod tip.